Welcome to the webinar. Today's webinar will be on cybersecurity, building a human firewall in a work from home world. My name is Priscilla Charles, and first I'd like to start with a little bit of housekeeping today. The webinar will start in a few moments and will be hosted by Jamie Kincaid of Novi4 and Michael J. Atquith of Vistatech. If you're joining us today live, thanks very much indeed for your time. And if you're listening to this recording, thanks for listening. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Michael. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining today's webcast, podcast powered by Vista Tech. Um, I'm very excited to kick off this first one of, of 2021 and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, Vista Tech is a global content solutions partner focused on creating compelling outcomes to some of the most iconic and innovative global brands in the world. At Vista Tech, we help build an adaptive custom global communication supply chain to support, enhance, and the overall user and customer experience, which leads to increased revenue opportunities and international commercial success. Uh, today, our guest is Jamie Kincaid from Nobi4, and she is the senior localization translation manager there. And um, KB4, or Nobi4, is the world's largest security awareness training and simulated phishing platform, uh, aspiring to be the net uh, to be the Netflix of cybersecurity training videos and content. I'm super honored to have Jamie on this webcast as she is a lovely and genuine person um, who grows silently, uh, Confucius, and leads with enthusiasm and empathy. In this increasingly digital first world of ours, I hope you'll find today's show informative and a welcome breather from, from your day to day. Well then, let's uh, dive right in um, with cybersecurity building a human firewall in a work from home world with no before and the various subtopics that we'll cover today. Um, I know Jamie is listening. Uh, Jamie, are you with us? Good morning, Michael. Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Um, so Jamie, we'll, we'll dive right in. Uh, you and I have, have been talking and kind of knowing each other for a bit. Um, so I, I noticed actually just recently that you have a, a BA in international business. And I wonder if this was ESP on your part. Oh, no, I wish I could say that, but it's not um, exactly the case. Um, so I have always been interested in stories about far, far, far away places, uh, fascinated by geography and maps. And I was also interested in uh, business. So when I had the opportunity to pursue an uh, international business degree, I just went ahead and went for it. I, without ever having any inclination, I would end up working in localization. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's awesome. And, and I think it's really cool that you have that. I do not have that. I mean, I got a BA marketing. So, uh, but uh, much of your day to day is focused on um, project and, and program management. How did you get into project management in the first place? I actually just started out um, coordinating small projects. I was working at a, a laboratory information system. Um, and then the, it just sort of naturally grew into bigger projects. And then I noticed a lot of um, career doors opening for my colleagues um, that were getting a, a project management professional certification. So I went ahead and went down that path because I just wanted to have um, more career options and it ended up working out for me and I got a lot of um, traction and haven't looked back since. No, that's, that's, that's perfect. And I was just kind of like those um, stories how everyone kind of starts in, in their in their field typically in localization especially um, no one is actually from uh, localization they're usually from all kinds of different uh, fields and and kind of fell into localization different types of ways um, so I imagine project management or program management is kind of similar in that way um, I uh, you you know you weren't always in localization e-learning or cyber cyber security how did you end up then working for no before so at the time I started um, at No Before, they were just really focused on looking for someone with a lot of project management experience and of course, charming personality. So I had confidence in my uh, PM abilities and I really um, was naive at the time about localization. I had no idea how nuanced the, the industry was, but um, I had some assistance and guidance and I was able to pick up on it pretty quickly. and. That's how I ended up at No Before in a nutshell. So how did I then end up um, getting a self-proclaimed introvert? 
on a webcast podcast like this, uh, you know, especially with today's or society's notion about introverts, um, how are you able to even do this? And are you okay so far? Um, you know, that's a lot of good questions in that. So you, and you know, um, that I really like podcasts. I think it's a really fascinating genre. Um, I love how it gives people a platform that might not otherwise have a platform. Um, but as far as introverts are concerned, there's a lot of misconceptions um, about introverted people. Um, the biggest one is probably that they're shy, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, I typically have uh, quite a bit to say about a lot of topics. I don't always verbalize what I think, but um, one of the things that um, is probably the biggest difference between introverts and extroverts is how they recharge. Um, introverts tend to feel a little more drained when they have to socialize for long periods or in big groups. Um, so I just pace myself and um, do a lot of little extra prep things to get myself ready so um, I can uh, totally um, have a few moments to just talk with you and share my thoughts today. So, you know, and that, and that's great. And I think it's good to kind of hear about introverts in that kind of way. When you think about being an introvert and leadership, um, are there some, you know, are there some that think that you have to be loud and talky, opinionated, you know, in order to lead, what are your thoughts on, on how to kind of shape your growth as an introvert, you know, versus being kind of an extrovert, which, which seems to be, um, you know, the situation where, where a lot of, you know, introverts are, are having a little bit of problems sometimes kind of advancing within their careers. So this uh, introverted leadership, super interesting topic to me. Um, the last uh, stat I saw uh, was about 40% of the population is more introverted. Um, and yes, there is still a little bit of stigma and it's not really discussed a lot um, about being an introvert. Um, so I was reading a book uh, recently, it was called Measure What Matters, and I'm always delighted when I hear a, a complimentary description of, um, of, of introverted leadership, and they were talking about the former CEO, Andy Grove. Um, I love to see those examples of successful people, uh, in part because the first half of my life, I was always encouraged to be more outgoing and outspoken, and this advice really never felt authentic to me. And then once I realized that I should just embrace my introverted being and move on, I felt like I got more traction and was able to make more confident decisions and that played to my quiet strengths. No, that's excellent. And do you have, do you have any advice for other introverts that are in kind of similar situations as, as you've been? I think it's a pretty individualized um, answer, but if I had to say something, I would say maybe you should try out different opportunities and see if they're a good fit. And if they're not, just know that it's okay to try something else and find other scenarios that play more to the introverted strengths and find something that's more authentically you. I think um, I tried too long to take advice from uh, well-meaning people and, and to sort of shape my personality. And instead of trusting my gut and going with um, the most authentic version of me and my leadership style. And do you, and, and how do you think that kind of like affects, I guess, your day to day um, and what kind of learnings can you kind of share with the audience kind of going through that, that experience and kind of coming into your own and gaining that confidence, you know, whether being an introvert or an extrovert, I think for anybody it's, it's um, got its challenges. So it's, it's always interesting to me to, to kind of hear how people uh, approach those uh, challenges differently. Sure. So like a lot of introverts, I really enjoy just observing people and um, seeing how they work together. I really glean a lot of information about how people react to each other in different scenarios just by watching. I can kind of sense um, who might need uh, something like maybe some extra encouragement on a project. Um, and because I spend some time thinking about the dynamics of what I observed quietly, I might be able to uh, anticipate problems uh, a little more readily and, and have some solutions in the back of my mind already thought out before anything really happens. No, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, anytime you can kind of overcome any kind of fear or challenges that you have, 
you know, and, 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 you know, I think it's, it's fantastic. And I love those stories. Um, so I want to shift gears. Everybody's uh, seeing this kind of image that are, that is able to see this on the live webinar today or the webcast today, uh, you know, uh, shifting gears to cybersecurity with these shark infested waters, uh, right around the time the pandemic was shutting down sports in the U S which was back in March, 2020. So I can't believe it's, it's almost been a year and the world uh, battled one type of virus, another weapon modeled after the same concept, but in digital form, uh, compromised an email system used by senior leadership at the Treasury Department and systems at several other federal agencies when uh, hackers, most likely Russian, compromised IT management software from a, a certain company. Um, I won't name any names. Um, the unsettling part about this breach is that the hackers were sophisticated enough that they were able to insert malicious code into computer networks and on an update. And then that went out to 8,000 or 18,000, I'm sorry, customers who uh, unknowing, unknowingly um, installed this uh, tainted um, software update into their system. Um, and then coincidentally enough, the, you know, I think it was last night or the night before, uh, there was another report that the third malware strain discovered um, in the same attack um, happened to be again discovered. And that was according to ZDNet. Uh, um, so I guess the saga continues further emphasizing the sophistication uh, of the malware and scams. Do you have any thoughts about this, uh, Jamie, just as we get started into cybersecurity? So yeah, it's it's pretty scary uh, climate out there. Um, when we should be doing everything we can to make sure we're not making it easy for cyber criminals to to get into our systems. So um, it's just the the real reality of the situation is um, we live in a, a, a world that this is happening a lot. Yeah, yeah, and this one seemed to be extremely um, sophisticated. Where I, I think they've had to kind of backwards engineer just to figure out exactly what to kind of do to um, approach this moving forward. So um, it gets a little bit scary for sure for everyone. Um, as someone that was new to cybersecurity, you know, just a few years ago, when you joined uh, No Before, what, what surprised, uh, surprised you the most about the industry? This is a really good question. Um, and, and I'm a little a little sheepish, but I'll tell you the answer. Uh, before I came to know before, I really didn't think I could make a difference in matters related to cybersecurity. I was sort of more head in the sand. Um, and I just hope my IT team would take care of everything. But after some training, I realized um, security wasn't just about relying on technology or your IT team. Um, there's actually a lot of things you could do to be proactive. And it's actually really empowering to know that you're part of a human firewall and helping to spot um, these uh, attacks. Yeah, no, and I think um, it's great too, because we kind of now, you know, saying the title. So this is cybersecurity, building up a human firewall in a work from home world uh, with no before. And um, can you talk about some of those examples and explain more about social engineering and phishing? Some of those uh, terms, a lot of folks out there won't, won't necessarily know the, de the definitions for. Sure, absolutely. So social, social engineering is just a, a fancy term that just describes when a criminal is trying to trick you into taking an action that's against your own best interest. Um, and then the most common form of social engineering is called phishing and that's phishing with a PH. And that would be something like you receive an email and you click on a malicious link or it has a infected attachment that goes with it. Um, a really scary stat I heard recently is that um, Google has flagged over 2 million new phishing sites in 2020. Um, so this is pretty common. And um, that's just one form of social engineering. There's different, more sophisticated forms of social engineering, like um, an attack through a text message or uh, a voicemail. And then there's attacks that are um, completely physically based. Say, take the scenario that you're um, going to work and you're um, getting ready to go through a door that requires a badge. Uh, for security and someone is there, you know, maybe they're holding um, a couple of coffees and their laptop bag and they ask mm -hmm. you to, to please let them in because they, they can't reach their badge. 
and you thought you were just going to be helpful and let them in, but really you were just socially engineered. And that's as, it can happen just as quickly as that. And it's super simple. So that's like a prime example of something a few human firewall could recognize um, and just spot that as potentially social, social engineering. So it's important to remember that humans are the last line of defense when it comes to staying safe. No, exactly. And, and you told me that stat the other day about uh, what Google reported about those, uh, those sites and how, you know, the thousands that are out there. And uh, that's, that's actually a 20% increase I noticed from, um, from 2019. So uh, it's only um, becoming more of a widespread problem. Uh, can you tell me, and, and for those that are listening, how does KB4 manage this ongoing problem associated with social engineering? So managing this problem is a, a two-pronged approach. Um, we do what's called simulated phishing, and that's where you are able as an organization to test your users on um, how um, likely they are to click on a phishing email. And we do that by sending like a, what we call a simulated phishing attack. And it would just look like an email and then um, we would uh, put some red flags in it and and see how likely it would be for the end users to click on some of those red flags or give up their credentials or you know even download a, an attachment or something along those lines and those um, could look like uh, any any form of hundreds of different types of phishing emails could be something like um, an email that had a subject line of click here for contract tracing or click here to donate to a really worthy cause that's in the news right now. Or it could be something even just work related um, from IT or HR. Um, I know yeah. <laughs> I, I get them all, all the time, um, uh, sometimes from Facebook and you know, and I don't even have Facebook, so. Yeah, I, have, I get the same ones from Apple and I don't even use Apple products. So you, usually you can kind of tell from the, you know, the images tend to be low resolution and, and then you also have a lot of, uh, you know, your, your account's suspended and I get all of those um, fantastic uh, emails that um, thankfully I, I don't click on. Um, but yeah, they, they do get uh, very much pull on the emotional strings to get the person mm -hmm. to kind of respond. So I think that that's, uh, you know, the major problem there, and it's not as, as cut and dry as it used to be. So can and you tell? They're, they're getting ahead. a lot trickier, um, and then they look very authentic. So along with the simulated phishing, then you follow that up with um, some new school security awareness training that really dives in deep and shows people what red flags you should look for. Like you have men mentioned them, emotional response, that's a big one. And then urgency is another. If you get an email that um, has either one of those elements that that should be a red flag to you to know that maybe something's up with this email and you should take a really close look at it. No, thank you. Thank you for um, talking about that as well. Um, can you tell me about phishing simulations you've seen and, and why uh, they're so important? I mean, I know you already mentioned these these emails, but is there um, you know more to it or can you kind of talk to that a little bit more? Sure. So I'll actually, um, I'll share one example that happened to me like that, like um, one simulated fish that I received, it was really authentic looking. It, it said it was from HR and they wanted to, to uh, discuss my employment um, uh, status. And it was, it looked like an invite. So it was very tricky. Um, so Simulated phishing gives you a chance to practice your skills in spotting those red flags. So you're confident, you know what to look for and you're less likely to, to fall for a real fish. Uh, and just it's important to note that email filters um, do miss or somewhere around 7% of malicious emails. So you can't always count on that. Yeah, can you give us some context how, you know, how common cybercrime is, you know, right now, the visual, there's an infographic for the audience there out there, and it's just how common is cybercrime. Um, I think it's a really good infographic, but can you speak uh, to this a little bit more? Yeah, we, we have this infographic to, 
to sort of educate people about um, how common cybercrime is, it's probably a little hard to say exactly because um, I suspect just a lot of crime goes unreported just because of embarrassment. But we have one stat that's pretty pretty interesting about the University of Maryland sites like over 2,200 cyber attacks per day. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's pretty that, that's pretty uh, crazy. And and do you have any kind of real life stories? Like you've mentioned the emails and and some of those things. I think everybody out there um, gets those emails. But do you have any kind of uh, you know examples of of real life stories? Sure, sure. I could share one example. Um, um, I heard recently uh, was a, a law firm was negotiating a settlement and just uh, as an agreement had been reached, they received an email that advised there was a new bank account number that should be used to send the funds. Um, luckily, the recipient had or the recipient of the email had uh, recently completed some security training and recognized some red flags like the suspicious timing and the tone of the email and went ahead and picked up the phone and called the sender. And it turns out that the sender was actually locked out of their email account and didn't send the email. Um, and as it turns out, the, a hacker had previously fished the email login and was just monitoring their email traffic, waiting for the right time to step in and try to intercept the money. That's a, a, a good story that shows just training just really does make a difference. And then, um, Contrast in my personal life, I've had friends and acquaintances tell me about different types of romance scams. Um, most recently, uh, someone who lost their spouse was active on social media where they were approached by someone from overseas who started chatting him up and eventually, you know, they decided to meet. Um, turns out that the, the person was not able to afford travel expenses. Um, my acquaintance had sent some money and then never heard from that person again. So these are just two examples um, that shows that cybercrime can pop up personal business. It can be large, it can be small. So just something all of us should be aware of. Yeah, no, knowing you, I, I had no doubt about the story where you said that, you know, you got that email from HR that, 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 that was probably a little bit hard. You're like, is it real? Is it not real? Right. Um, so, so I, I, I totally know how you um, could teeter on that a bit. So, uh, so no before has a lot of multinational clients and I'm curious if there are any verticals, industry verticals that have more of a vulnerability um, over another or where there's more, you know, focused attention uh, needed over another in comparison. So, no before really doesn't focus on any particular industry. Um, everyone needs cybersecurity training in some form. And we say from the mailroom to the boardroom, everyone can be part of a human firewall in some way. Yeah, you're, you're always so uh, succinct, you know, with your responses and uh, even when you aren't sure. So that's another thing I, I really appreciate about you, Jamie, is, is it, it helps me kind of be a little bit more short as well. And um, my, uh, my, my CSO or my manager, um, the chief uh, uh, sales officer, Un, um, is always about brevity. So she repeats that a lot. So I'm, I'm very much trying. So your uh, response to that last question really reminds me of that. But are, are you aware of any regional um, specific issues you know, with cybersecurity or, or not? So short answer, I'd say no. Crime's pretty global. But in terms of you think about phishing, the topics used to elicit that emotional response might vary regionally, but the attack is still the same. You can look for the, the red flags in the same way. And is there any, um, or is there data tracking the reaction like and the performance from training versus, you know, after training as, as people and end users start to move through the, the process of receiving that training? Sure. Um, we have what's called a uh, fish prone percentage. Um, and that is just a, a term that means we can measure how likely the users are to click on a simulated phishing email. And then we can provide training. And then um, at some time later in the future, um, take that percentage again and compare and see the um, difference the training makes to measure that improvement. And then, mod and then modify the, the program accordingly. Um, 
So is there any user statistics that can be shared that illustrate the importance of localization and what it has done to open up, you know, potential opportunities with multinational organizations and, and their end users? So um, we we feel like a lot of our clients are like like no before where they're medium sized, but they have a global workforce um, and we just want to help focus, um, help these organizations focus on protecting their growth and success um, and manage cybersecurity risks that come along with success in any business. So having localized content makes training more effective and personalized to the wider audience. Yes, that's, uh, and can you speak to any like specific data points relevant to KB4's, you know, global users and, and their international brand specifically when it comes to localiz localizing and also globalizing? Sure. Um, so since the time I started in 2018, uh, the number of languages has that we support is nearly double up to 34 now, it's heavily supported. And with another 10 or so languages, um, we have limited support for. Um, we went from having just like 1200 pieces of content when I started to now um, we've surpassed um, over 5,000 pieces of translated content. Wow. Right. And, and that was in a, a, like a, a sh pretty short time frame of over a couple of years. Um, but if you're ever curious about it, you could hop over to the No Before website and sign up for a free preview and take a look for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and we'll definitely uh, talk a little bit more about some some freebies out there as well. Um, how has uh, COVID impacted users, certain companies, industry verticals that uh, have been at the at the forefront since COVID started? So it, we had a, a really a sad but interesting blog post from last month uh, regarding how um, in 2020 healthcare was targeted by ransomware, um, actually dozens of hospitals. It's really um, unfortunate uh, that criminals go for value, uh, vulnerable targets um, because the victims are likely to pay like schools and hospitals. And, and it's not always necessarily um, banking or high dollar industries. Yeah, I think that's really interesting that you you mentioned that and an education and with e learning and obviously working from home, you know that all kind of connects. And then you've got this healthcare, you know, issues and um, you know pharma. And I've heard some problems with you know vaccines due to cybersecurity kind of threats. So uh, yeah, it's it's it only gets a little bit crazier how criminals go after those those vulnerable um, targets. Has there has there been more interest for these training courses due to work from home environments and, and, you know, with organizations, you know, dealing with the mix of, of family being at home, you know, specific cybersecurity risks. So I heard uh, another interesting stat from um, our December blog post um, on the know before site. Um, that a survey is taken mentions that organizations are citing their two biggest security challenges are remote workers keeping them safe and protecting against phishing and social engineering attacks, uh, about 42%. So I, I think that speaks to that. Yeah, and, and has global perspe perspective changed authoring of courses or content choices when it comes to courseware development? So we try to develop our courses from a global perspective and adjust, um, making sure nothing is too US centric. Um, we have global content teams um, and they have the freedom to develop in their respective regions. And then know before has evolved to localize some of the content um, developed in the non-US markets. Like anything else, um, some of the content is not a good candidate for translation or localization, but some are. Well, one example I could think of is our UK team develops um, um, really humorous content that goes through our localization process. And then it, it, it's well received and receives high compliments from its users. It's always fun to have people enjoy training. Yeah, and, and when there's, you know, that's great about uh, them enjoying training, of course. And I think that the, the content that you guys have is so dynamic 
Um, and then, as you kind of mentioned, it's it's interesting to know too that there's certain courses that you obviously know need to be localized, and there's other courses that you know um, are not kind of relevant to to certain things. So therefore, they don't need to be localized. So I, uh, with humor as well, I think you can do a lot of things with um, you know style guides and glossaries and other things like that to to make sure that that the essence of that humor is is resonating through to the different cultures. So I think that's um, great to kind of learn about as well. So uh, can you tell us about the techniques used and how global uh, is being incorporated into the authoring of that content or authoring of, of your content? And if that is part of the equation as new e-learning content is being developed? Sure. Um, so a few things I can mention is like professional development for our team members on learning opportunities. Um, we have a quarterly know before localization summit meeting to share best practices across our um, different content teams. Um, one thing I, I heard recently, our SVP of learning and innovation, John Just, he said something that really struck a chord with me of, about how we approach e-learning content. And he said something like, um, modern e-learning is a dialogue and meaning it was data-driven and listening to customer feedback and making adjustments. Um, one example uh, about this was we received feedback um, from users that they didn't really feel like cybercrime was, was happening that often. So we um, made a point to illustrate in our training how often it does happen. And then that um, we have a similar approach to localizations, continuously using the dialogue and data to make improvements. And then at the very start, K4 was a, a global model, and, and that was always a part of the equation. But now with COVID and work from home, uh, broader user data, feedback trends, impacting clients and multinationals across various indus industries, how has this changed the focus or, or has it changed the focus? I, I can't really speak to the early days of, of no before. Um, but I could tell you um, when I started in 2018, uh, demand was already there and we had to have to acquire and hire people all over the globe and use good vendors and suppliers. Um, it was a bit of a roller coaster to get it started. Um, with the with the pandemic, I definitely say cybersecurity awareness continues to be very relevant and important in our changing world. Um, we're all vulnerable to hackers every time we, we log in and widespread crime plagues individuals, businesses, everywhere. Um, we could fight it together as a human firewall. Um, but we're doing a lot of fighting together these days, so it makes sense. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It runs, runs in parallel. Um, has, there, has there been any changes or discoveries that have changed the way that the videos of the courses are being developed, uh, especially in advance of translation and localization? I wouldn't say there was been any process type changes, but speed became more important. Um, the world changed really fast in 2020. Um, yes, it did. Was feeling the pressure to get out certain translations like our work from home course um, to get these out faster to help people sooner. Um, in cybersecurity in general, we always want to get that content out fast because um, the newest and latest info about attacks is evolving all the time. Yes. And, uh, and, and then for our listeners, uh, you know, periodically, as I mentioned before, KB4 has free courses available and there was a link that would have been flashed to you visually. Hopefully you were able to take that down. If uh, for some, some reason you missed it, um, feel free to, to message um, either myself or Jamie and we can shoot you over the link uh, without a problem. Um, and, uh, you know, since the, uh, and, and we kind of, um, we kind of have some images that are kind of all over the place a little bit here, but um, since the integration of AI is in your products and services now, and everybody is super interested all the time in artificial intelligence, uh, and, and you know, so fascinated with it, I wonder, you know, how AI is being used in KB4's Mod Store, which is actually the library of the uh, video content that is stored, uh, much like you know, um, like a Netflix kind of streaming service. Yeah, AI is like sort of a hot topic. It's not, um, it's, I'm definitely not the, any sort of subject matter expert on AI, but we do um, utilize some of that. Um, 
for like a, a recommendation, sort of like um, you would expect to see from, from a streaming service. Um, you can get a recommendation based on what others in the industry, um, what training they used and found effective. So, so it's definitely a, a, a thing. I'm sorry, I can't speak more about that particularly. No, not not at all. Um, and and can you tell us more about? You know, we we talked kind of a little bit and keep kind of hinting at the fact that that no before is is um, the you know the Netflix of the cybersecurity training world. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and and you know specifically as as talking about some of these courses and some of the images that are being flashed or specifically from no before courses? Sure, uh, we draw some parallels to streaming services. Um, one thing we always keep up on is constant fresh content and from different all, different regions. Like I mentioned, we have multiple um, content teams all over the globe. Try to keep things compelling and interesting and just fresh. Um, for example, this year we featured um, Jenny Radcliffe, a real life social engineer slash hacker rather than a, um, a fictional character we had used in, in years past. Um, this um, content was a very high quality production value shot by our UK team under the COVID protocol. Um, very dynamic and engaging courses uh, and are important to building the, the human firewall. Yes, and the one the the course that that uh, also was given away for for free is the Internet Security When You Work From Home course. I uh, just want to kind of remind everybody about that. You've also kind of talked about social engineering uh, red flags um, and Jenny Radcliffe, which um, also for the audience, uh, they saw some pictures and images of of Jenny Radcliffe and then also Kevin Mitnick because um, you have the uh, 2020 um, Kevin, you know, uh, Kevin Mitnick security awareness training course as well. Um, so quite a bit of content and um, kind of all over the place. Uh, for people who are are unfamiliar, can you tell us more about Kevin Mitnick? Sure. Um, so just wanted to mention that we do have a, a, like a really wide variety of training content, um, quizzes, knowledge checks um, in our modules. And then we have just videos, posters, infographics. Um, our content ranges from comedy to drama, live action. Uh, some is animation, it could be a short two minute video or robust 45 minute training. There's basically something to suit every type of organization and what they're looking for. Um, and you had asked about Kevin Mitnick. So he was a, a wanted hacker in the nineties and he's now uh, Noble Force chief hacking officer. He's very passionate about cybersecurity. He uses his vast knowledge and experience to explain uh, different types of hacks in some of our content. It's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, I love that. I love that title. Um, you know, executive title chief. I know. I hope officer. you have a, a title that that's yeah. the cool is that someday. Yes. Um, so according to Cybersecurity Insider, study reveals that the U.S., no surprise, is the largest data theft target in the world. And I was very surprised that China and India, um, as large as they are, they're actually in the 20s in terms of, um, you know, top countries with the with you know, the most data theft or, or targets in the, in the world. Um, and then South Korea's second and UK was interestingly fourth. Um, and then as well, which I thought was crazy is just to start looking at some of these, you know, breaches, the biggest data breaches of the past decade. Um, and you've got like, you know, Yahoo uh, in 2013 and 14, Adult Friend Finder in 16, uh, MySpace and, and many others that were um, listed as well. Um, in this digital first world that we live in today, organizations across most industry verticals um, have been increasing focus on customer experience. And um, across, you know, most industry verticals have been increasingly focused on, on user and customer experience. And there are many ways in which uh, to do this, which, you know, with inclusive language, uh, multilingual content, accessibility, um, this could also include cultural intelligence uh, and adaptive elements uh, to the customer and pre-sales journeys. Tell me and how this or already has been built into uh, KB4's model and, and as they've kind of built these courses and feel free to touch on any of the other courses that, that we've been kind of flashing up on the screen um, just to kind of give a little bit more context to some of these images that uh, 
some of the folks are seeing out there. So you you touched a lot uh, on uh, on accessibility. Um, it's a very high priority to make our content as accessible as possible. Um, it is a legal concern, but it's also just being a good citizen. Um, somewhere about 15% of the world um, experiences some form of disability. Uh, about 300 million people worldwide have visual impairments, and about 500 people million. I'm sorry, 500 million people worldwide have um, some sort of uh, disabling hearing loss. So we'd like to say that accessibility is baked into the content, meaning we build in accessibility features from the very beginning of the source content, well before we um, are even thinking about localization. So, and then periodically we have a third party review our training and give us feedback sp specifically in regards to accessibility and, and what the newest things are and if we could be doing things even better. So it's just sort of a constant uh, continuous improvement. And also, of course, the uh, thing that you said I kind of coined was, you know, multilingual accessibility, right? Um, so uh, as well, and, and kind of knowing that that these courses and things have to be localized in, you know, 33, 34 plus languages uh, is, is hard to kind of think about as well. So, um, you know, one element that I find particularly interesting about no before's localization program, um, as it seems as if it's been the approach uh, from the beginning, was to focus on quality and doing cross checks to help ensure brand, you know, is resonating through the communications and the content to the end user. Uh, can you tell us more about this philosophy and what you and your teams have been doing to make sure that the quality is, is continuously benchmarked and measured? Sure, and that starts again well before translation is ever even thought of. We have multiple rounds of QA on the source. Um, and then early on, we realized we wanted feedback from our internal resources and local offices from around the world. Um, but we also know it wasn't ideal to ask them to um, be able to, to get all that feedback at the volume and rapid pace we needed. So to be able to do uh, language quality uh, at scale, we needed um, multiple reliable suppliers in different various roles. Um, most of our translation projects were um, reviewed by a, a third party supplier independent of, uh, of the partner that was doing the full localization effort. Um, and as you know, um, e-learning is pretty special in localization because it requires uh, multiple file types, MP4s, JSONs, multimedia files, um, because the content includes uh, so many parts like voiceover, subtitling, image localization, et cetera. Um, so we think this process uh, resonates well through our clients and, and um, of the the overall effect is the end users are, are happy with the product and they appreciate a good uh, user experience. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And I think, um, you know, one of the things I think that is incredible about how No Before kind of went about this is that they seemingly understood that they don't have the internal, you know, reviewers to really provide the feedback all the time and they didn't want it to be kind of bottlenecked and right. Uh, and all of that. So I think that that is is kind of good because a lot of a lot of clients and prospects of ours, you know, we hear kind of this uh, situation scenario where they're they're trying to rely on those resources and and they just then it becomes bottlenecked and then they can't be very scalable. So um, it looks like they they definitely had that planning. So um, so yeah, for those out there that are Generation X, you you may remember you know growing up with the biggest threat. Uh, as kids, you know, being that infamous, I call it the A-team uh, like van with no windows, um, if you can remember that, or worse, um, they had dirty uh, van drape uh, drapes, which, which I see from time to time still today. Um, and that cautionary tale about, you know, the creeps in the van trying to lure us kids away with candy or someplace exciting to go to get into their van or whatever. And nowadays, there's this totally different set of risks out there that people need to prepare younger generations for, especially as they're working from home. Um, and you've got families all working on the same machines, the same networks, et cetera. And, you know, I'm just kind of curious, like developing and, and a lot of folks are seeing some images uh, 
specifically that were made for children uh, for cybersecurity awareness. And I think that it's, you know, really, really great that, and I kind of tipped my hat to know before and putting together these materials, you know, well before when thinking about this well before the work from home um, environment and, and it kind of touches on social media and some of the other things that the kids are doing. Um, so yeah, maybe you could speak a, a little bit more to that and more to the types of uh, stuff that you've done specifically for children. So um, that in particular was a fun project and we had just had one uh, short episode, especially for kids and it was called uh, Captain Awareness Conquering Internet Safety for Kids. It was sort of a modern day stranger danger. Um, we only have a, a small selection of, of kids content, but it is fun to work on, really enjoyable projects. Um, another cool training series I wanted to mention before we have to, to call it a wrap uh, is our Inside Man series. It's uh, award-winning live action drama. It's movie quality, um, has multiple episodes following really compelling characters, incredible writing and acting. Um, so we were really proud of that one and, and our team in the, the UK. Yes, it's very cheeky, but uh, for it's sure. Very great. Yeah. Um, so with all these trends and unknowns for the future, do you anticipate any hurdles to overcome in 2021 as part of KB4's localization program? Of course, there's many hurdles that we're all uh, dealing with in our day to day, but um, specifically those hurdles that that uh, are part of KB4's localization program moving forward. Do you, do you anticipate any any uh, problems, challenges? So, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about modern e-learning is a dialogue and that, and part of that dialogue, um, we have always uh, liked to get focus groups and get their feedback, but it's been a real challenge with work from home and COVID um, with not being able to do an on-site visit to gather the, the feedback we would normally get. Um, it's particularly important for certain types of, of of content that we are able to, you know, make sure that the, the linguistic team executed the purpose behind it and um, make sure the, the integrity is maintained while being uh, culturally sensitive and intelligent without any bias. And it's much easier to, to gather that feedback in, in a group setting in person. And that's been a difficulty and will probably continue to be a difficulty for some time. So that's that's one thing that I think a, a, a lot of people are struggling with in that same sort of um, type of problem. Yeah, there's a lot more personalization in general. And I think when you have that, um, this is quite the challenges you typically need in the scenario you were talking about cultural experts, you know, for each locale to work together to optimize the process uh, for these, you know, specialty type uh, projects and situations. Um, and of course, as, as you already know from experience, that interpretation and impression may skew the collaboration process from one culture to another. Um, and this is where I kind of talked a little bit or just kind of mentioned style guides come into play, terminology management, you know, glossaries, um, and then having those, those candid conversations uh, and, and collaborating together with both uh, your internal teams or a client's internal teams and, um, and also, you know, getting uh, the linguistic lead that's, that's from that same kind of customized team um, from, from a supplier like ourselves. You know that's that uh, has a lot of different challenges because there's a lot of moving parts, and then you've got on top of that all these, you know, cultural issues that you're dealing with or differences. I wouldn't say issues, but you know, being in global business for a, a long time now, um, it's it's those types of calls. I actually really enjoy those calls, but you've got, you know, uh, Japan Japan's culture is is a stark contrast to you know how how things are in Brazil or in the Netherlands. So. Um, so yeah, I just think uh, that's really great that you guys already have anticipated that is something that needs to be looked at and addressed, and that um, and that you guys are are you know dealing with that head on. So sure, uh, it definitely is a collaboration. We definitely rely on um, cultural fit type advice from trusted suppliers, experts, our local offices. It's really it. We really put a lot of effort into getting a lot of feedback from. Um, all these different areas to make sure we're really 
nailing um, localization as well as we can. Absolutely. So as you know, we're running out of time. And um, so I thought it would be fun to uh, kind of do, you know, a last minute, um, uh, I guess, kind of like a, a lightning round. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to see, are you game for this, this little bit of lightning round where we can just fire off some fun questions that are, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit fun to end this, this, uh, this podcast webcast. Sure. I think I'm up for the challenge. Let's do it. Great. So, um, all right. So what's the best security tip, cybersecurity well, tip? I think my favorite um, cybersecurity tip that it's uh, like just a qu quick one is like when it comes to passwords, um, longer is stronger. So make sure your passwords are a little bit on the lengthier side. Awesome. Did you pick up any new hobbies since the pandemic started? This is a great question. And yes, I did actually. So um, I've been um, playing darts. Um, I got a dartboard now. So like in between um, calls or on my lunch break, when I'm working from home, I'll, I'll play a few darts. Um, how about you? Did you pick up any new hobbies while you? Lots of, pandemic? lots, lots of walking. Um, but I think I'm not alone in that. Um, lots of walking, uh, very nature, a lot of nature hikes, you know, um, and I'm kind of averaging, I, I'm pretty proud of myself. I'm kind of averaging about three and a half to, to four miles a day. So it's pretty crazy. Uh, it's good for thinking. I love it for thinking and listening to podcasts as well. Um, they, they, thanks for asking me. Um, what's the first thing you are going to do when the pandemic is over or hopefully oh. somewhat over or whatever it ends up being? Right. Um, so I think it's a toss up for me. Like um, I would see maybe a concert or international travel, um, whichever I could pull off first, I think. Yeah, it's not, yeah, that's not too introverted. But yes, I can agree with you on the concert. Uh, that's like probably the thing I'm, I'm, I'm yearning for the most. Um, you know, that would be a, a lot of fun or go to a, a Wrigley Field Cubs game uh, with fans again would be uh fantastic. I, I kind of dream about it at night. <laughs> so um, what's the first thing you're going to do? And oh, I already said that one. Um, and uh, oh, no, what? Yeah, no, I did. I did do that one. So um, so that one doesn't that one I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself. Uh, so with both of us uh, loving and living, you know, podcasts these days, what's your favorite one right now? And why? I do love podcasts. Um, my favorite podcast has got to be Freakonomics. Um, I love how, you know, and it's part of their tagline, hit, exploring the hidden side of everything. Um, I really enjoy that. They have a lot of different topics and it really varies um, a lot from episode to episode. And then a close second, I'd say be uh, Hidden Brain. That's always a good one. Um, they have a lot of fun topics as well. Yes, both of those, as you know, I, I listen to those as well. Um, I believe even Freakonomics, you probably introduced me to or told me about at some point. So I do appreciate that. And, and yeah, myself, I've been listening um, uh, a lot of industry ones as well. Minter, Dials, Leadership and, and Brand Strategy Podcast, um, World, uh, The Worldly Marker with Catherine Bussman. Um, I listen to quite a bit because they have a lot of great guests um, or she has a lot of great guests and she's a fantastic host. And then a shameless plug, of course, for X Cultural Vista Talks and all things global. Um, so yeah, so I really, uh, appreciate everything today, Jamie, um, having you on the show, uh, powered by Vista Tech, of course, it's, it's always a pleasure to, to talk and, and, um, you know, about various different subjects. Um, so thank, thank you so much for that. Thanks for having me on, Michael. It was a good time. Yeah. And for finally, for anyone who has any follow-up questions for either or the both of us, please feel free to private message us, um, on LinkedIn. There's also uh, an events page that has been set up. So I, I've tried to kind of put some chatter on there so that you could feel free to ask any questions that you might have for either myself or Jamie. Um, I am your host, Michael Asquith at Vista Tech, signing off, uh, you know, signing off, but um, and also be the seed that grows silently, stay open, and cheers all. Thank you.